<laughs> so, uh, so why don't we get started? We're extremely happy to have John Cochran here with us today. Um, uh, I don't need to introduce John. Uh, everybody knows who John is and what important contributions he's made. We're very happy to have him on board, uh, and we're also very happy to have uh, uh, seminar guests from all over the world uh, with us: uh, from Canada, uh, uh, Rick, um, Sweden, um, Frankfurt, uh, Indiana, uh, Princeton. Uh, let me know if I'm missing someone. New York, maybe, already? Uh, anyway, um, uh, very glad to have you all over. And uh, John, uh, uh, the floor is yours. OK, th thank you very much. Um, let me encourage people to jump in with questions. Uh, I, I know the format's a little strange. Uh, and uh, I can't see you raise your hand. So just be rude and barge in uh, at any moment. Um, I, I much prefer to have uh, back and forth then a long talk where everyone gets lost and falls asleep. Uh, and if we don't get through all the slides, but instead have a long, a better discussion, that's that's fine with me. Um, so uh, with that said, um, also, um, uh, maybe it would be good if you tell me who you are when you ask a question, because I can't uh, I can't figure that out either. <laughs> I can't see much. <laughs> so um, I want to talk about uh, two papers. Um, and you can see, I hope, can everyone, is, can anyone not see the slides? Because uh, that's important. There's a lot of pictures involved here. So, the slides. Uh, good. I didn't hear a note. Um, the, there's the title of the two papers. Um, one of them is a, um, uh, is a uh, um, macroannual paper, and the other one is, I think, just out in the European Economic Review. Eric was the editor. Thank you, Eric. Uh, did a great job on it. Um, so uh, it took a lot of work. Yeah, <laughs> it did actually. Uh, so um, um, let me start with a question. Uh, question of, of economic theory. Let's make a prediction. What happens when we hit the uh, zero bound? Um, and it's we, we just have seen the experiment uh, finally run. We, we talked about this for years and years. What would happen if we hit the zero bound, sort of as a <coughs> our abstract question, economic theory, and then we hit the zero bound and we found out. And I think the surprising result of this experiment is nothing really happened. So here, here's the graph, uh, and, and watch the little hand tool so I can point to things in the graph. The uh, federal funds rate. Uh, reminds you of, of the history of interest rates, which uh, they go down in recessions and they go up in expansions and then they hit zero in 2008 and pretty much stayed there ever since, only slightly lifting off in the U.S. Uh, now, but, but still very slowly. Uh, whoops. <clears throat> then uh, what happened to uh, inflation uh, during that? Uh, I'm sorry, the, the reserves line here reminds you of the quantitative easing episodes, the other part of, of monetary policy. QE1, QE2, and QE3, where reserves went up by trillions uh, of dollars. Uh, and so what happened to inflation in this remarkable period of monetary policy? Well, inflation goes down in recessions, and then it comes back up in expansions, and it trundles along. And it went down in the recession and came back up after the recession. Look, the pattern in the, in the 2003 was almost exactly the same as the pattern in, in 2011. And then it came up, and then it just trundled along, uh, back down its slightly downward trend. Uh, and this period here is, is the most interesting, I'd say. It's, it's past the usual cyclical dynamics. The interest rate stuck at zero. We're, we're in passive monetary policy, and yet inflation just trundles along. Uh, basically, nothing happened. Excuse me. Um, and, and even more remarkable, because we are now clearly in, in the zero bound. So, so what happens at the zero bound? with huge amounts of quantitative easing, basically nothing. Uh, and if anything, look at the volatility of inflation here and the volatility of inflation here. If anything, inflation is probably less volatile with the interest rate stuck at zero uh, than, it, than it was with the interest rate you're moving around. Um, so what did we, uh, did we've had this quiet, stable period of inflation at the zero bound. Uh, certainly with passive monetary policy and huge monetary expansion. What did we not see? Well, we, we didn't see what, what many theories predicted. We did not see a deflation spiral. Um, many, the, the, uh, 
the New York Times op-ed said, here comes the deflation spiral. The Wall Street Journal op-ed said, here comes the monetary hyperinflation. Uh, that didn't happen. We, we didn't see excess volatility. We don't really see any change in dynamics. Uh, if you think of the zero bound as a state variable for economic dynamics, well, the, the zero bound seems not to be a state variable for anything, really. We're just trundling along the way we always trundle along. Um, but John, yes. a, this is Eric, I have a question. Um, so some central bankers might think, well, policy really hasn't been passive because once they hit the zero lower bound, they did QE. And so that was sort of an extension of active monetary policy. What is your yeah. that? Uh, can, I, can I put you on hold? Because I have a slide. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Slide mark objections. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you ask that question again. Uh, I, let, let me just get there. Uh, that'll okay. be easy. Because um, then we can unite all the objections in one place. Um, this is just the, the, the introduction. Uh, similarly, here's unemployment and GDP. Uh, unemployment came down, maybe, you know, the same pattern as before, a little faster maybe. GDP growth has been too low in my view, but less volatile, if anything, than it was before, just about the same. You know, there's a recession, you come back. You just don't see important uh, change in dynamics at the zero bound. It doesn't seem like a state variable for anything. Uh, it was just quite no volatility or whatever. Um, here's a Japan, um, same pattern, except it went on for 20 years. The interest rates stuck essentially at zero. If you wake up in 2001 and see the data only up to this point here, you might well, and you know, in your theories say at the zero bound, you get a deflation spiral. You know, it, it would make perfect sense to say, oh my God, here comes the deflation spiral. And yet then nothing happened. We just sort of trundle along at the Friedman optimal rule, zero interest rates, slight deflation, um, and, and on we go. Uh, Europe, um, same pattern, interest rates hit zero, then they go slightly negative, and uh, inflation just like, trundles along. The, the contrast between Europe and the US is, is instructive. We are starting to raise our interest rates, and inflation is going up a little bit. Europe is uh, still in negative interest rates and inflation keeps going down. Uh, that does raise the cause and effect question, which we'll, we'll come back to, but that, that's the correlations. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the theories. I said theories made predictions. Uh, let me remind you what those theories are and, and what predictions they make. The paper has more equations, I'll, I'll, since I'll do more pictures, uh, but there are equations for in, in the paper. So. So, uh, Theory number one, which I would say uh, uh, characterizes most of the policy world and anyone over 50 at central banks is, is <laughs> uh, or, or yeah, the, the people who don't, who write the things without the equations, um, is basically stuck in adaptive expectations, ISLM with adaptive expectations. Uh, and that theory fairly clearly predicts a, a deflation spiral when you hit the zero bound. So, so the way this works, the dynamics, I summarize them in, in one equation here. The, the way the dynamics of adaptive expectations models work is inflation is, there's some eigenvalues that are greater than one times lagged inflation. This is an unstable system left to itself. Um, and that's what Friedman told you in, in 1968, that interest rate pegs are unstable. Uh, that Taylor told you in 1993, passive policy is unstable. Um, now, in this kind of model, the Taylor rule stabilizes inflation. It, it takes a system that is unstable on its own and makes it stable. Uh, my, my seal is, is uh, my best example. Uh, <laughs> the seal's trying to balance inflation on its nose. That's an unstable system. But if the seal moves its nose more than one for one to follow the ball, then the ball, uh, then, then the whole system becomes stabilized. So the job of a central bank is to move the nose more than one for one with the ball and, and therefore keep, keep the whole system stable. <laughs> but, but when the nose gets stuck at the zero bound, then there's a clear prediction. It's, it's going to fall over and, and we're going to see a deflation spiral on unstable uh, dynamics. Um, the the uh, paper has equations to do this. 
Yeah, you can do this in about five minutes, and, and I'm not going to use five minutes. I'm, I'm just, I want to advertise it because I'm proud of how simple the equations are uh, in, in this uh, paper. But I think that ought to be a familiar enough proposition. The view of the point is the view of monetary policy. It's a system that is inherently unstable, and the central bank has to move interest rates actively to, to restabilize it, hit the zero point. Prediction. It, it's going to uh, it's going to fall over. I, I did a uh, quantitative version, Quanti barely barely quantitative. This is a simulation of a standard adaptive expectations model. What happens when there's a negative shock that brings you to the zero bound? So uh, inflation in, uh, inflation interest rates the shock hits. What happens? Inflation starts going down. Interest rates fall more than one for one. The seal is is trying to put his nose under the uh, uh, un, under the ball, but then the seal gets stuck at the edge of the pen, the nose can't move anymore, and so there's the deflation spiral uh, prediction of, of adaptive expectation models, which I think you can see the point coming, that didn't happen. Uh, and, and that's what's key about this experiment. You, you, you couldn't really tell uh, what the stability, is the system stable or unstable? Well, you can't really tell in normal times. Once you hold the uh, once you hold the nose fixed, then you, then you can find out. So model number two, um, rational expectations, new Keynesian models. What everybody under fifty at uh -huh. banks or not in policy positions does. <laughs> uh, these models uh, are quite different. Uh, in this cat class of models, inflation is stable all on its own. If we peg interest rates in a new Keynesian model. Inflation goes back to where the interest rates are. I, I uh, as uh, my, my example picture here is from uh, Benedict Schmidt Grain and Uribe. Uh, they've got the dynamics of inflation under a Taylor rule, and, and I hope you remember this. This is the active policy region. This is the zero bound region, and in the zero bound region, you you have to be passive, and and therefore, if you just peg rates, inflation will come back. Now, our our grand experiment. Um, it's my number one interpretation is, as Eric already figured out, this graph is, boy, does that look like a stable system. That looks like if you just leave interest rates alone, inflation gently uh, follows where interest rates go. It does not spill over, uh, it does not tip over into a spiral, especially so in Japan. Uh, it bats around a little bit. There's some wind in the sails, but, but you know, the, the, if you leave interest rates alone, in, inflation once real rates settle down, inflation has to you know, go back to where the interest rates are. That seems like a great feather in the cap of the new Keynesian or rational expectations model. Let me, let me tell my story that the intuition behind this is, is pretty easy. Um, rational expectations is like someone driving a car looking forward to figure out where the road is going to go. And, and if you do that, then the car will be stable. The car will naturally follow the road. Adaptive expectations is like driving a car looking in the rearview mirror the whole time. Now, if you look in the rearview mirror while you're driving down the road, the car is going to veer off the edge of the road. It's unstable on its own, and, and it needs a Fed to bring it back. So, so looking forward is naturally stabilizing, and looking backward is naturally destabilizing. Uh, now, uh, the problem with the class model is that that's what this whole paper was about. It predicts at the zero bound there will be sunspots, self-confirming fluctuations, um, uh, um, extra volatility, um, because the model only ties down, the dynamics are expected future inflation is a stable route times current inflation. The model doesn't tie down unexpected future inflation. That can be anything. So the delta are, are potential sunspot terms. You can always jump away from here and come back, jump away and come back. And the point of the Taylor rule, as, as you all know, in that kind of model, is to deliberately make the system unstable. It's a very different kind of model. Rather than taking an unstable system and making it stable, the Taylor rule in new Keynesian models takes a stable system and makes it unstable. And the point of unstable is to make it determinate. Then there's only one knife edge solution that, that remains. The problem with this kind of model is it predicts volatility. It predicts when we hit the zero bound, there will be volatility. Now, now this too, um, before Eric goes nuts, uh, <laughs> you could easily say, well, maybe there just weren't any sunspots uh, and, and get away with that. But this was a core prediction. 
this, this sort of central to this whole literature was the idea that passive policy leads to excess volatility. It, it is Clara Garley and Gertler is, is like probably the most famous empirical paper, and they said, 1970s, passive policy, multiple equilibria, <coughs> sunspot volatility. 80s, active policy, cured the problem. Uh, generations of papers wrote, like this one, we have to do something about this, because if we ever hit the zero bound, there's going to be this huge inflation volatility. Well, that was a clear prediction of, of the model, and, and it just didn't happen. And now here, uh, perhaps I'm influenced by my time at the University of Chicago, but there is still a, a large group that thinks that inflation is MV equals PY. My little symbol here is Milton Friedman's license plate, which really was MV equals PY. Uh, <laughs> and I need to figure out this the fiscal theory of the price level on our license plates uh, at, at some point. It's <laughs> too big. It's probably no coincidence that he was driving a German car, right? <laughs> uh, I think that was just because Germans make good cars. <laughs> um, but that makes a clear prediction, too. If you take the money stock from 50 billion to 3,000, in traditional monetarist view, velocity is stable in the long run, and we don't like this liquidity trap idea, and there's going to be a high price. Um, that's just a, a, a version of the, of the sunspots, which you've seen. So let me sum up the Michelson-Morley <coughs> analogy. Michelson-Morley, by the way, I, I was a physics undergrad, so that struck me as an important one. This is a famous experiment in physics in the 1900s when they tried to measure the speed of light in different directions. And of course, the speed of light should be slower in the direction that the Earth is going, because the Earth is flowing through the ether. Uh, it turns out the speed of light's the same in all directions, and from that alone, pretty much you get special relativity. So it's an experiment where theories predicted something to happen, <laughs> nothing happened, and, and that silence uh, was very important for, for distinguishing uh, classical theory. So that's, the, that's what Michelson Morley is doing in the title. <clears throat> So we have, um, I try to do picture versions to liven up seminars. Uh, here's our theories of, of inflation, the adaptive expectations, <coughs> uh, classic policy world. Hold on, let me close my it, it's, it's Hoover and <coughs> people are starting to show up to work. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Inflation is inherently unstable. The Fed stabilizes it. Well, we didn't, when the seal goes complete, the, the ball falls off and it didn't happen. The uh, second view is that inflation may be stable. Professor Calculus here uh, is, is the view of the central bank in the stable uh, world. Uh, inflation is, is the uh, little pendulum. And if he just held his hand still, inflation would, would come back. Of course, there's wind. So the inflation is always batting around uh, in, in the wind. But if you hold your hand still, the inflation will eventually settle down to wherever your, your hand goes. Uh, so this is the two alternatives for uh, our view of central bankers. The sunspot view, I, I found a gorgeous early uh, view of sunspots, but that's a picture view of excess volatility. And of course, uh, OK, enough jokes. Uh, <clears throat> we had our experiment. And the, what I will take as the lesson of the experiment is that inflation can be stable and quiet, that's the opposite of volatile. Uh, these words are tricky, by the way. So, so stability, instability, determinacy, volatility, all get kind of <coughs> So stable means the nature of the dynamics. Quiet means lack of volatility. Oops, got to watch my mouthing here. At the zero bound, and by extension under passive policy, even a, even a peg, uh, the data seem to be telling us inflation can be stable. And <coughs> Lesson one, stable versus unstable, it's stable. That seems pretty deep, a lesson of this experiment. Lesson two, huge amounts of excess reserves. I mean, Zimbabwean amounts of ex excess reserves, uh, as long as they pay market interest, are not inflationary. There, there is such a thing as a liquidity trap and, and, uh, or liquidity equivalence, and we're at it. And that uh, um, active versus passive policy or being at the zero bound is just not a key state variable for, for volatility or for dynamics. Uh, implication, uh, three theories hit the dust. That's, that's the implication. So next theory, uh, is, is there one at least on the shelf? 
that can account for what we just saw. And uh, yes, uh, or at least my conclusion, yes. Uh, and it is, uh, no surprise, uh, the fiscal theory of the price level married to New Keynesian models. So I'm going to keep 99% of New Keynesian models, sticky prices and rational expectations, but I'm going to add the fiscal theory of the price level. So what does that do? The top equation is the equation that's going to be on Eric's license plates. So that, uh, when the state of California allows some symbols to be on license plates, uh, the vet real value of nominal debt is the present value surpluses. Now, um, move this equation forward one period. So it's BT and PT plus one. Uh, multiply and divide by PT there and take, unex uh, take innovations, ET plus one minus ET. So from that equation, that's how you get to that equation. And notice what we got. Uh, the T stuff is all predetermined. Unexpected inflation is entirely due to innovations in fiscal surpluses. This is what we were missing in the New Keynesian model. The New Keynesian model was great, uh, except for it had this problem. It, it, it only determined expected inflation. Unexpected inflation could be anything. Well, now unexpected inflation is tied down to the revision in present value of future surpluses. And by the way, if you hate, if you don't like the fiscal theory, which is fine, this equation is true in standard New Keynesian models. So you should, this is in a footnote about how passive fiscal policy adapts to inflation. But even in standard models, we can look at this equation and say, oh, does it make sense that the unexpected inflation or deflation is matched by changes in fiscal surplus? In particular, any unexpected deflation uh, has to mean that debt is worth more. And that has to mean that fiscal policy will raise taxes or cut spending. If, if, even if, if a bubble, if a sunspot, if a Federal Reserve, if something cuts the price level in half, then we must believe the taxes will double to pay off the doubling of the value of government debt. If you don't believe that, then the price level can't go down by half. That's true in fiscal theory and, and anybody's. Theory. Sorry, someone asked a question. Who tried to ask a question or were you just... Uh... Well, actually, can I ask a question? Yeah. So here you assume that the beta is a constant, no, but in your other research, I asked you once before, you assume that this trust discount factor is moving around a hell of a lot and explains all the asset pricing equations. How can we make sure that not the beta is moving around a lot rather than the S and we learn about the S? Uh, you're exactly right. Uh, and it, so this was the really simple model for a seminar slide. <laughs> but, uh, the, actually, we'll, we'll see if I ever get to the back end of the slides, you'll, you'll see a, uh, a chorus saying, as you take this to the data, forget about X, pay all your attention to the beta. But in fact, in thinking about Japan versus the US, in thinking about why does inflation go down in business cycles when surpluses go, go down, uh, you really have to think hard about almost all the interesting time series and cross-sectional variation is coming out mm -hmm. of the discount rate on government debt. Mm -hmm. Also, this is one area of debt, and it's right, we need uh, term struct, we need, uh, we need long-term debt. Yeah. This is not the apply to data. This is the simple example version. This is not the apply to data version. Uh, and, and you're exactly right. Think about the discount rates in the fiscal theory, the surpluses, yeah, just like, just like asset pricing. Thank you. Uh, so what have we done? We, we have now, uh, we've got a model that solves viral, it's, it's stable, and the indeterminacy, because we, we pick out exactly, if there's no news about fiscal policy or discount rates, then, then there can't be unexpected inflation. So we solved the sunspots. Uh, and we have a very simple new Keynesian model with, with an, and a, just a slightly different rule about which equilibrium we pick. So uh, a peg can be stable and now determinate and quiet, so long as there is no news about fiscal policy or, or discount rates to fiscal policy. I don't know why there is or isn't news about those things, but at least it's possible. That's why I'm, I'm very careful to use the word can. <laughs> it's possible uh, that our current uh, situation is stable and, and determined. So now back to Eric's uh, question. Now I will stop and invite some questions. Uh, this paper is 120 pages. What in the world happened, especially from a guy who writes advice about how to write papers and always to keep them short? Uh, well, <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, 
I, I, I tried to answer just about every seminar comment uh, that ever came along. And so I'll start with, uh, in red are, are, are a couple more important ones, and in black are advertisements for, for other ones. Eric's question is, well, wait, John, uh, what certainly are, uh, are, are, are the, everyone over 50 at a central bank would say, I can say that, I just turned 60, so I can make fun of old people. Um, is, uh, is, is wait, but it's, it's we, let's try to rescue these old views. Well, uh, let's try to rescue the idea that it's unstable. Um, the, the economy is really unstable. Well, maybe it really is unstable, but the massive quantitative easing just offset the deflation spiral. So, so let me tell the joke version, which some of you have heard, but it's still a good joke. Uh, you wake up in the morning uh, on the cruise ship. You slept beautifully last night. It, it was quiet. You go to the captain and say, wow, that was a quiet night. Good. Uh, you, did you sleep well, too? And the captain says, no, no, no. While you were asleep, the hurricane of hyperinflation over on the right-hand side, on the, sorry, starboard side, on the left, the looming spiral of, of uh, the looming deflation spiral, I, your captain, steered you right down the middle so that you would be, so you sleep calmly at night. Didn't I do a great job? Well, maybe. And, and that's why Occam's razor is the next, uh, uh, item on my, on, my, on my list of heroes here. You can't disprove anything in economics. Uh, you can always come up with uh, an exposed patch to, to fix any theory. But really, what's the simpler interpretation of the data? That it's really unstable, and then they just made the Fed, the central, our central bank so perfectly offset two explosions to guide us to the stability or, or that it's actually stable. So Eric, are you happy now? He puts his hand on the camera. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a good logical ploy, but I'm not sure that it would convince anybody who thinks that QE actually did something. Well, the question about QE is, is this, I, it probably did something. It, oh, sure. Let's change long-term interest rates by about 10 basis points for a month, say. The fascinating thing, but, but the theory said you set off an atom bomb. Uh, you know, consult anyone from the University of Chicago, 1965, and many of them are still around, and say, what happens if you raise excess reserves from 50, no, 19 billion to 3,000 billion and you leave them there? That's an atom bomb, and we're arguing about 10 basis points of, of, of interest rates? Uh, come on, that just should have done much more than that. Well, I think the the other point that comes into play is what Marcus was alluding to. Mm. At, the, at the zero lower bound, it seems to me we had pretty large negative real interest rates. So the question is, to what extent did that feed into real discount rates? The, so your betas. And those are pushing toward deflation. Um, now, we don't know what the expectation of surpluses was. But so I'm kind of going beyond your simple story, and I think one needs to do that to convince people. No, I think you're exactly right, and that is so. Let's go. But this is sort of on the. Uh, I'll let you skip ahead slides this time. There's a, uh, a whole bunch of what's wrong with the fiscal theory questions, which I'm sure you answered many times or more than I have. One of them is if we go into a recession this period here. And uh, deficits are exploding, right? 900 billion worth of stimulus. In the end, 5 trillion worth of, of deficits. At the same time, the long, run, uh, the long run forecasts are just awful. The US has no plans of ever paying this stuff off. And, and the question goes, well, why aren't you seeing an inflation? Don't you fiscal theory guys have an embarrassment? Well, uh, we're seeing deflation here. What's going on? And, and of course, what's going on is, well, interest rates went, real interest rates fell. So the discount rate on government debt, every, there was a flight to quality, not a flight from quality. And if you want to understand why do people, the demand for government debt is low rates of return. It's not the rate that I would agree with you on, on that one. Let me bring up, um, he's having troubles here. Hopefully the phone to check because I, you know, I sent the, the announcement that I could not come to. Yeah, okay. yeah I, I guess that's good. I guess that's good. <laughs> Settle down. Guys, can you turn off your, your uh, speakers or uh, mics uh, when you're talking? Thanks. 
So the most common objection, I, I got to be fair, that the uh, standard, the new Keynesian literature moved on and does not really, does not uh, think of the zero bound just in the uh, current reaction. It, uh, it's the um, equilibrium selection comes from actions after the zero bound ends in most of the standard literature now. So here's a graph version of the way um, most of these uh, uh, papers work. Um, there's a period of the zero bound where there's a negative shock. That's in here. And then the period of the zero bound ends. Mm -hmm. During the period of the zero bound, we're in uh, stability. See, these are the inflation lines uh, all converge. Uh, we, these are multiple equilibria, but notice that they're all heading to the same place. So we have multiple stable equilibria. But after the zero bound ends, the uh, central bank can one is once again de intentionally destabilize the economy for all but one equilibrium, at least locally destabilize the economy. So the story goes, yes, you have multiple equilibria here, but everybody knows that when the zero bound ends, the central bank will go back to destabilizing the economy. That picks this equilibrium here, think backwards, and that picks this as the equilibrium path beforehand. And this also uh, the standard New Keynesian analysis you're about. We should have a big jump to uh, deflation, uh, and, and then which slowly, slowly gets better. That's the way the models uh, work now. Uh, and to which I, I'm just going to answer, I'm going to acknowledge it and answer Occam's razor. Do you really think that in 1994, the reason Japan did not do this, uh, did, did not have a, have a big disinflation, was everybody knew that in the year 2030 or whenever they finally get out of the zero bound, that their central bank would deliberately destabilize the economy for anything but one price level, and that selected one of multiple equilibrium. That I'll just leave that as the Occam's. I think the answer to that is obvious, but that's the Occam's razor. Uh, this, this seems like a pretty delicate. Uh, uh, um, the paper goes through the standard fiscal theory objections, uh, and the answer is pretty much uh, time. If you want to fit the data with the fiscal theory, as Marcus pointed out, you need to think about time varying discount rates. Um, so let's, uh, unless you guys want to, this is your chance to raise objections to what we've done so far. Otherwise, I'm going to move on. You lost your chance. Let's move on. <laughs> okay, can I just ask a quick question? <clears throat> Please, What's about uh, all the theories where money is a bubble? How, how is your fiscal theory of the price level consistent with that, or would you dismiss them because of some transversality condition? If I just go back to some old Samuels and old G framework or something like that. Yeah, uh, so the fiscal theory doesn't say that uh, other theories are logically wrong. Uh, it just says that uh, which one applies to the current economy right now. So. Um, I don't have any nasty things to say about bubble theories of money. I just like yeah. theories where money is backed. Now, in particular, the bubble theory of money needs money to be one particular asset that we all agree is money and nothing else can be money. So if you agree that Bitcoin is your bubble, you better not invent Erythrium because you, you, you can't have substitutes for money. So when I look at the economy, it looks to me like we have, we're basically in a electronic barter economy where, where we send, we've decided to use government debt uh, primarily is money, although lots of short-term claims substitute as money. So the central concept of, of something that's dominated in rate of return, and that's the only thing that's money, doesn't seem to me to fit our current economy. But I, I shouldn't talk I about, think about this. many other theories. And, you know, I think this one works on its own. It doesn't have to cast mud on other theories. <laughs> Let me move on to the, to the second. Now, now, if you bought my, uh, uh, here's my professor calculus imitation. Uh, can, you, can you guys see? Here's my little pendulum. By the theory that this is pendulum stability, that uh, uh, interest rates inflation work, works like this, uh, then uh, there's a very uncomfortable implication of that fact. If it's stable, then if the Fed raises interest rates, inflation must go up. Stability implies the, the Fisher uh, response. Higher interest rates means higher inflation, at least in the long run. Now, this only that the short run goes the other way. And that, now, you've got to watch carefully uh, so I can do this. If I raise interest rates, watch inflation go the other way in the short run. 
You see it? Well, maybe not. But it's entirely possible that even if the long run response is positive, there's a negative short run response. And that accounts for the fact that most people think that when you raise interest rates, inflation goes down. Because we don't really see the long run. You, 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 whoops, you only see the, the short run. So that, um, if you buy stability, the consequence, the unavoidable consequence is in the long run, it's, it's positive. Raise interest rates, you will raise inflation. Uh, <clears throat> but is it possible that, that there's, a, there's a negative short run response? So that's the second half of the paper. That's the Fisher part. What is the response of, of uh, inflation to interest rates? Uh, especially considering that we seem uh, in, in this world where we think it's stable in the long run. So uh, let me show you, let's think about this. Let's start with the frictionless model. The model is just interest rate is real rate plus expected inflation. I'm going to use my fiscal theory model. Unexpected inflation is revisions to uh, fiscal policy. And monetary policy is, is, changes in interest, is changes that have no fiscal implications. That's going to be my definition of monetary policy. In central banks, the one thing they're not allowed to do is, is change fiscal policy. So what happens in this model if we raise interest rates uh, uh, to inflation? Well, if you raise interest rates, expected inflation just goes up. And with no fiscal news, there, there can't be any unexpected inflation. So if you raise interest rates, <laughs> Inflation just goes up the next period. They get the long run, but you don't get the negative we were looking for. Well, duh, you might say, if you weren't being so polite. Uh, of course, you need pricing frictions, right? If you want to get a temporary negative response, the, the intuition goes, well, with sticky prices, raise nominal rates. That means real rates are higher. Real rates are constant in this example. Real rates are higher, that lowers aggregate demand, that lowers inflation through the Phillips curve for a while, and then the long run can take care of itself. So let's add pricing. I, I thought I was going to get an easy, great paper out of this. I'll just add pricing frictions, and I'll get a temporary negative response and, and the long run positive response. That doesn't work. <laughs> this is the standard new Keynesian model, and this is the new Keynesian model's response to a rise in interest rates with sticky prices. And all it did was to smooth out the uniformly positive response. So it's not true that sticky prices means higher interest rates means temporarily low inflation. How do we get temporary low inflation? So that, that seems to be a puzzle. Here is the standard New Keynesian model. Uh, the, the New Keynesian model with passive fiscal policy. This is straight out of Woodford's textbook, uh, the, the three equation model. It turns out the standard New Keynesian model is even more Fisherian than the model I just showed you. Um, the standard, the, the difference is it, it allows, I'm not going to allow a uh, jump in inflation here. There can't be jumps in inflation because there's no jump in fiscal policy. The standard model allows a jump in inflation. And if you raise interest rates permanently, inflation, in, in my frictionless model, inflation went up a period later. In the standard New Keynesian model, you raise interest rates permanently and unexpectedly, Inflation goes up immediately and one for one. So that's even more Fisherian. Sticky prices is, is not uh, the answer to our, our quest. What is the answer to our quest? Well, a, a great advantage of giving papers at seminars all over the place is occasionally somebody answers the question for you. As Chris Sims did, it took it twice. I, I gave this paper twice with Chris around and Chris said, John, you really ought to read my step, Stepping on a Rake paper. And the first time I, I tried to read it and I thought it was really hard, so I gave up. Uh, and then the second time I went to a conference, Chris said, John, you really ought to read my Stepping on a Rate paper. And this time I did. It took me six weeks, <clears throat> but I finally understood it. Uh, and so Chris has the answer. And in fact, I should have recognized it. It was, it was implicit in a paper I wrote a long time ago, and I didn't even recognize that fact. Anyway, enough stories. Um, how can we get a simple model to deliver a temporarily negative inflation uh, in response to interest rates going up. Well, let's go back. This is, again, with apologies to Marcus, the simplest possible model, constant discount. Constant I'm going to add long-term debt to the fiscal theory. So the numerator here, this is bond price of maturity J, outstanding debt of maturity J. So the top is the nominal market value of government debt. 
This is the current real value of government debt, and that has to equal the real value of surpluses. So now, what happens if the Fed raises interest rates, and importantly, if the Fed raises interest rates and leaves them there, uh, so that bond prices go down, long-term bond prices go down? Well, if long-term, sorry, am I getting this? Uh, oh yeah, higher, fewer interest rates is lower bond prices. Just sign check for a minute there. So this thing went down. This thing is predetermined. This thing doesn't change by assumption. The Fed can't change fiscal policy. So this must go down. Higher interest rates must involve a jump down in the concurrent price level. Now, let me try to give you some intuition. What, what happens? Uh, bond, nominal bond prices go down. So the market value of government debt goes down. But the real value of government debt to investors hasn't changed. If you just sit there and hold it, you, you get this, the sort of present value of future surpluses. So if the nominal market value has fallen and the real value hasn't, this stuff's a great deal. You want to buy more of it. How do you buy more of it? By buying less of goods and services. That lowers aggregate demand and, and brings down the price level. So here's a little simulation. It's, it's calibrated to the maturity structure of US government debt. If the Fed raises interest rates and leaves them there forever, bond prices fall, what do you get? You get a jump down in the price level. Then this is a frictionless model. We'll add sticky prices in just a minute. But higher interest rates must mean higher inflation. So the price level must start rising. But you get this one period jump down. So we got it. Here is a very simple model in which raising interest rates lowers the price level. Now, there's no, be careful, there's the real rates constant. There's no Phillips curve. There's no intertemporal substitution. This is wealth effect of government bonds, if you'd like, this jump down in price level. The mechanism is very different, but, but you've got the pattern we're looking for. Now you might notice we've also got in here, this is, we call it a higher interest rate that stays up forever, but forward guidance will work the same way. If the Fed can, if the central bank can just say, we're going to raise interest rates in the future, that will affect bond prices. The lower bond prices will have the same effect, even if uh, the, the central bank doesn't do anything right now. And, and this is the red line uh, illustrates that one. In the red line at this time period here, the central bank says, we will raise interest rates in the future, but we're not doing anything right now. What happens is bond prices go down, the price level jumps down, and then nothing happens to inflation in immediately. And then when the nominal interest rates happen, inflation goes back up again. There is a pure forward guidance shock. A forward guidance shock is the opposite. Whoops, in a forward guidance shock, you announce that in the future interest rates will be lower and therefore you get a burst in aggregate demand or a burst in inflation today. So, so <clears throat> we've got forward guidance and we've got uh, the negative effect of interest rates all, all in one. And so John, a uh, quick question. So this is, assuming yeah. that the, this is assuming that the expectations hypothesis holds perfectly at this point. Uh, absolutely. So I'm, I'm showing you the absolutely simplest model. What, what do we want to do in reality? Uh, yes, we want risk premiums. We want the time bearing discount rate. Maybe we want some feedback from price levels to discount rate. We certainly want sticky prices. Um, yeah, so yeah. What, what I love about this, so I am not advocating that you stop at the simplest model. What, what, I, what I love about this is you can start at the simplest model. <laughs> To get the basic sign of monetary policy, you don't need sticky prices, heterogeneous consumers, uh, segmented bond markets, all this great stuff. That stuff is great. And you're going to have to add it back in when you want to get reasonable dynamics. But, but you can start with a frictionless model that kind of gets the basic mechanics right and then add the stuff you need when you need it. So and as with Marcus's question about time varying discount rate, no, no, no. Put those back in when, when you want to match data, but but you don't need them. And, and that's what I think the need is uh, here. John, may I ask yeah. you one yeah. follow-up question on that? Do you actually need to get this result that you can get the price level to fall when you hike the rate? Uh, do you need positive steady state debt or is it, you know, you could have zero steady state debt or do you need a positive debt level in the steady state when you, when you solve the model? You, you, need, you need positive. So you need, uh, this yeah. is not an always and everywhere theory. <laughs> we need nominal government debt, including money. So you can get yeah. rid of all, you can finance everything with just money if you want. 
need some sort of government provided nominal nominal something. Uh, you need a nominal something over here, and you need a real something over here, and you got to divide the two. Yeah, gotcha. So we could do it just with money and no debt, uh, but we happen to have a lot of debt now. Mm -hmm. If you only had money, this effect would not happen. So this effect needs outstanding long-term debt. Yeah. If you only have one period debt outstanding, then the bond price can't fall. If you just have money, the price of money is always one. So this thing doesn't, you don't get the downwards, the only way you get the downward spike is, is with outstanding long-term debt. So the fiscal theory works, but this prediction of higher interest rates, lower inflation only happens when there's long-term debt outstanding. Uh, let me skip a slide or two of uh, the fiscal theory of monetary policy. Here's the same mechanism with uh, um, sticky prices. So I worked out the same thing. Uh, so what happens when you put this, let's add complication number one, sticky prices. So we've got our same stuff on the left-hand side. Um, it turns out the only effect that it has on a new Keynesian model is, is different equilibrium selection. Now, in the case of sticky prices, we need to have time varying discount rates. Uh, it's, it's our first time varying discount rate. As you, if you raise the nominal rate and the prices are sticky, you're raising real rates. Raising real rates uh, raises the discount rate of government debt and you gotta keep that effect in mind. So here, here's the simulation with sticky prices. The interest rate goes up and stays up. What happens to inflation, you see as usual, just a smeared out, here's a more realistic version of dynamics. The, the uh, inflation goes down and then slowly comes back up again, uh, rather than instantly comes back up again. So we're on, we're on our way to something that looks like a VAR, uh, aren't we? John, can I ask you, um, yeah. I'm just uh, thinking about Turkey, because there's this big controversy with, between the central bank and Erdogan, the, uh, the president of Turkey, whether the Fischer equation holds or not, and he's arguing for a lower interest rate in order to get inflation down. And wouldn't it be the case that probably, I don't have looked at the numbers, but I guess the Turkish government debt is probably very, very short term. So that would mean that actually Erdogan is right in this battle or because... Uh, no, so, <laughs> thank you. Because uh, I probably won't get there. I have a slide saying this doesn't oh. apply to Turkey. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> because, uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to follow the logical conclusions here. Because uh, I'm very, the idea that you know just lower interest rates and you lower inflation, extremely uh, weird. Uh, but you need to have the the fiscal. I'll give you the answer. You need to have the fiscal backing. So in our case, uh, you know we lowered interest rates and inflation went down in, in the Great Recession. But our flight to quality happened first. There was plenty of demand for government debt, uh, and and we've seen over and over again countries. Uh, you know, inflation tends to happen with pegged low interest rates that are, in some sense, fiscally unsustainable. So, so you need you need strong fiscal policy, or for some reason, people to want to hold your government debt uh, for for this to work. So, so uh, you cannot substitute low interest rates for number one for this to work. Remember, it's only a long run. It's only in the long run. So it has to be credible. To, to get higher interest rates to higher inflation, it has to be credible that it's going to stay there for a long time. You have to wait out any temporary negative effect, uh, and you have to have the surpluses. You have to have the fiscal policy working. If the fiscal policy isn't working, you're going to get inflation uh, no matter what you try. So yet, there is an upcoming slide saying it doesn't apply to Brazil and it doesn't apply to Turkey. Uh, it, you need this. You need. But is, is there any way to test this theory, which has very strong implications that? depending on the maturity of the government debt structure, uh, the Fisher reaction is, is different. Yes. Uh, well, I'm hoping finally for some way to test all this, but you are exactly right. Um, let, let, let's, try, let's try together to find some testable implications. One is that longer maturities of government debt will make an interest rate rise have a bigger effect on the price line, and shorter maturities of government debt uh, we'll make it, we'll make, sorry, this, you, you wait by the bees. So more persistent movements in interest rates should have bigger effects, uh, which by the way, so this is in the standard New Keynesian model, um, persistent movements in interest rates uh, have, uh, have a weaker effect than you need transitory movements in interest rates to get it to go the wrong way. This is the opposite prediction. 
Persistent movements in interest rates have a bigger effect, and more outstanding government debt has a bigger effect. In fact, you can measure the deflationary pressure by the change in market value of government debt. So there's a one summary statistic here. Uh, the change in market value of, of all government debt should tell you how much <coughs> pressure there is. That, that strikes me as until the test is run and it doesn't work and I have to weasel my way out of it, uh, that seems like a, a useful way, way to go. Let me, uh, let me skip to a couple of uh, policy implications. Um, so what do we have so far? What have I suggested? Uh, we have a stable, quiet, zero lower bound. We did not see the deflation spiral. We did not see sunspots. We did, uh, and we did not see sunspots. So, so that, that um, by implication, you know, the, the zero lower bound in these models is, is similar to passive policy or PEG. Uh, that these, these things just will not have. Passive policy is, is rehabilitated. Uh, large interest paying reserve don't cause inflation, and, and if you thought otherwise, it was wrong. Uh, so I implications, uh, we have this, uh, we have this uh, long run uh, Fisher effect, long, it's a version of long run neutrality, and possibly a negative short run effect with, with a slightly new model. So what are the policy consequences of, of what I've done so far? Uh, number one, um, don't fear the zero lower bound in the balance sheet. Uh, at least the U.S. Central Bank is, is, seems to be very afraid of what happens if we hit the zero bound again, uh, anxious to lift off and headroom and, and talking about abolishing currency so we can have negative interest rates, and seems in a big hurry to get rid of the extraordinary stimulus of the balance sheet. Uh, if you follow so far, this suggests that no, uh, we can lift the Friedman rule if we want to. We can have, we can live, Jim Bullard calls it perma zero. Uh, you won't have unstable inflation. It may not be optimal, but you don't have, won't have unstable inflation. And we can live even at higher interest rates. Uh, we can lift the Friedman rule. Uh, huge amounts of reserves paying market interest are just sitting there doing nothing but providing lots of liquidity. Uh, so no need to be so scared of the zero bound or to be in a huge hurry to get, get rid of the, the balance sheet. This was to liven up the end of a seminar what, to remind you of the Friedman optimal quantity of money. <clears throat> the Friedman optimal quantity of money is a lot. Uh, and why not? Why did Friedman say that's the optimal quantity of money and not advocate for it? Uh, he was worried that you'd lose price level control. But now we know you're not going to lose price level control. You can have all the interest paying reserves you want and inflation seems to be stable. That, that, that's, a, that's a big lesson. Can yeah, you ask uh, something about uh, QE? So what your theory predicts essentially is that you wanted to QE and essentially make government debt more short term. The QE is essentially is buying long term government debt and is replacing it with short term. And then you can raise interest rates in order to create inflation. Is this first to big time QE and then raise interest rates because then the Fisher equation immediately holds. Oh, and then you can make the Fisher equation, then, then the dynamics happen quicker. Right. Yeah, so the step to rig effect is gone away. Oh. Or you maybe want to issue a lot of long-term debt so that you can have the negative, uh, play with that negative short-term reaction. Um, um, but I'm at the zero lower bound. I can't go short on the interest rate. Oh, yeah. Now, there is actually, I shouldn't, QE does not say, uh, uh, I, I skipped over that one. QE is actually quite effective in fiscal theory. If you buy up long-term debt, um, that, that also raises the price level in the short run and lowers it in the long run. It, it moves inflation from the long run to the short run. So there is actually a direct QE mechanism in the fiscal theory. That's in a slide that I skipped because I wanted to finish the policy implications in the five minutes that, that I have left. But, but um, Q, so we have, however, this, this ability to affect interest rates, even if the effect inflation is no lower bound. Uh, forward guidance, QE, uh, and interest rate policy all work in a frictionless fiscal theory, uh, and that's that's news as well. Um, so, so what should the, let me move on. Just what should the Fed do with interest rates uh, if you if you follow everything we've done so far? So the Fed can just peg it at zero or peg it at two percent if they want. Uh, that's possible. It isn't necessarily a good idea, but they can do it if they want to. Now, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that, if, if you just peg the nominal interest rate, then when the real interest rate rises, we have to have disinflation. And when the real interest rate goes down, we have to have inflation. Uh, 
And that with sticky prices, that takes a while and will cause output variation. So maybe the right thing to do is for uh, the central bank to vary interest rates. When the real interest rate rises, raise the nominal rate. When the real interest rate declines, as best the Fed can see it, lower the nominal rate. Uh, that will produce more stable inflation. As you can see, we're actually heading to something that looks like exactly what central banks do. And I think that's a good point. This does not lead to some horribly uh, crazy counterintuitive view of central banking. It leads to pretty much what they do. Raise nominal rates in good times when real interest rates rise. Lower nominal rates in bad times when interest rates fall as much as you can. Don't make inflation take up the slack. Let the nominal rate uh, take up the slack. Uh, now, um, the, the Fed can, uh, it can do all sorts of other things. It, it can still offset shocks. Let me skip that one and move on to the bottom one. It, you know, uh, if, if you want to offset shocks with time varying rates and, and so forth and fine tune policy with a complex, there's nothing in the stability for instability that says 99% of, of what central banks are doing is wrong. It just says that um, it's a stable system. It's, it's this guy. So um, uh, you, you, the whole stability of the system isn't at, at risk if you get things uh, slightly wrong. So, so the, um, the Milton Friedman's hot versus cold shower debate uh, continues. The fine-tuning rules versus discretion or simple stable roots debate continues. It just tells you that not actively moving stuff so much isn't the disaster, the instability disaster. Thought. I have a picture version of it. Uh, let the debate continue. Central banks could, could be like this, or central banks can be like that. Um, it's just uh, stability isn't, uh, stability and spirals aren't, aren't at, uh, aren't, aren't at issue. Uh, I, I do want to advertise that monetary economics then becomes like regular economics. We have a simple frictionless benchmark, and then add all the frictions you want. But, but you don't have to have the frictions to get, get things off the ground. And that's the lesson of the, the fiscal theory of, of monetary policy. So here's my two more, my warning slides, which I did want to get to. Uh, as Marcus said, <laughs> so I, this got picked up, the first draft got picked up by some journalists. That I, I first actually heard about it from Brazil. Journalists called me, oh, Professor Cochran. Uh, so all we have to do is, is lower interest rates and we'll lower our inflation. And uh, I screamed no, uh, because uh, it has to be persistent, credible, and it must have the fiscal backing. This equation's out there, and if you don't got the S's, you're not going to get the P. <laughs> and and that's, uh, that's the end of that. Um, now, uh, fiscal policy, uh, the, the standard questions, which you've been polite enough or uh, technology has limited you to not answering, uh, you know, where are the surpluses? <laughs> Why is it uh, that, that the whole government debt? Uh, why does Japan, with huge government debt, uh, have low inflation or deflation? Why does, in the U.S., uh, with horrible-looking deficit forecasts, why, nonetheless, are we doing so well? Um, well, as, as Marcus quickly figured out, you've got to watch the R as well as the S. Uh, and if you want to understand the value of government debt, the rate of return. Uh, now, now, this equation is in every model. This is not a testable equation. It's in every model. So it's a question even New Keynesians have to ask. You know, why, why is this working? Well, if, if there's a lot of value to government debt, either people think there's going to be great surpluses, or the rate of return, people are willing to hold government debt at a very low rate of return. And I think it's pretty obvious which one it is. <laughs> in fact, the, the late Marco Bassetto just wrote a, a paper on R less than G. The current puzzle is the rates of return are less than the growth rates, which drive surpluses if they would ever be positive. Uh, the puzzle may not be why isn't there inflation. The puzzle may be why isn't there deflation. The difficulty of, uh, non, of government debt being valued for a low rate of return is that can evaporate quickly. I would sleep much better at night if our government debt were valued because of good surpluses rather than because uh, uh, rev, I will have to admit a, a nebulous low uh, risk premium. Uh, that risk premium can change quickly. If that does, we get inflation uh, quickly, and there's, there's nothing in that. Thanks. Okay, that's what I got to say. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I can take more questions, or uh, if you want to end on time, we can end on time.
So, John, this is Eric again. Um, you know, I think one of, I mean, your point that this valuation equation is in every model is well taken and it's not something that's testable. Um, but I think one of the issues that keeps coming through to my head is you've got this infinite sum. And, um, and if you think about the political economy issues with fiscal policy, um, I wonder whether thinking about truncating this in some fashion so that it actually has to happen over some finite horizon starts to get us somewhere in thinking about testable implications. Because the, the big issue is always, well, yes, yeah, surpluses just have to adjust in present value. That could happen 500 years from now. So we're never going to see that in the data. Um, but in practical terms, you know, surpluses actually tend to adjust much more rapidly than that. Mm -hmm. Do you think about that question at all? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, so I come from where I spent 20 years in asset pricing. This is like prices, present value dividends. Uh, and so, yeah, um, you know, maybe, maybe uh, Snapchat's valuation comes from dividends in the year 20, 2,500. <laughs> uh, but but you, you typically need to see those dividends sooner rather than later or, or right. change. Now, this is, the difference is, this is the equation for short-term debt. It's kind of a puzzle. You, you know this, but not everybody in the room may know this. Uh, this, this this present value thing comes by rolling over short-term debt. So there's a bubbleish. I hate to use that word, but I will. There's a bubbleish uh, or multiple equilibrium feeling to this. That uh, um, this this relies on I hold short-term debt because I'm going to roll it over to someone who's going to roll it over to someone. And, and the minute you lose confidence in that rollover, that's that's when the R's explode and it blows up. So I really the lesson I take from this present value is a less comforting one. It's, it's a present value induced by rolling over short-term debt. I'm willing to hold short-term debt because I think somebody else is willing to hold it tomorrow and he thinks somebody else is willing to hold it the next day and, and we're iterating that out 500 years. Uh, and you can break that chain of expectations quickly and that's exactly the kind of thing that, that keeps me up at night and, and when there are decades of deficits ahead and only the promise wow. that sooner or later America will get after trying everything else. But can you give us some idea? I should know this. How many years was the primary surplus positive in what countries? Oh, well. Uh, because uh, it has to be significantly positive at some point in the near future in order not to have a bubble component. I believe very much there's a bubble component to it, but uh, I'm biased on this. Well, um, I, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, I'm happy to add bubble components too. Uh, and. Uh, and, and the, even without the word bubble, rolling over short-term debt, as I think we all learned in the fall of 2008, <laughs> is a very dangerous strategy. And then Greece learned that lesson again when it, Greece didn't really have a, a payments problem, it had a rollover problem. So rolling over short-term debt is, uh, I mean, that, that's the picture that this paints in, in every model. Our governments have, in fact, debt that is quite short-term compared to the surpluses, which if they ever come are, are years away. And we're trying to roll them over, and we're vulnerable to rollover crises. And I, um, I but if you look at the U.S. after the Second World War, how many years were was the government in surplus, and how many years in deficit? Oh no, there's there's many more primaries. So these are primaries. Primaries. Yes. Not not and uh, so there is there is primary surplus, <clears throat> that, and it's been done before. The uh, United Kingdom, uh, uh, you know, Queen Victoria paid off the uh, Napoleonic War of 250 percent debt to GDP. Uh, by a steady stream of surpluses for a century. Of course, having the Industrial Revolution happen didn't hurt, uh, but, but it, is, it is possible to pay off uh, debts. And, um, so this equation does hold. I mean, you know, maybe you don't like the ET part. <laughs> uh, uh, but, and, and it is also true that most variation in nominal debt is resolved by variation in the ex post return, disappointed in uh, So we, all the asset pricing so we use this equation asset pricing all the time and, and we can just copy, edit, copy, edit, paste every single controversy involving that equation and asset pricing and have fun with it. Relabel it fiscal theory and double our secrets.
So I'm looking at the boss here for uh, how, how are we doing? I, I have another question actually. Um, um, so in, in the model with long-term debt, is it true that uh, uh, QE type policies, so directly affecting longer-term bond prices, is always more uh, uh, efficient um, than than steering the, the short term, the short rate? Um, no, actually, and that no. uh, that's actually what I'm writing. It depends right on now. the maturity structure, right? Uh, no, uh, so um, so you can do things in principle either way. Uh, if you buy long-term debt. Let me try to do it in words. We have future surplus, right? And long-term debt is a claim to a future surplus. So if we buy back some long-term debt, that means there are fewer claims to that long that future surplus. That that will raise the price level and lower sorry, lower the price level and, and therefore raise the interest rate to that period. Uh, the problem with that is I cannot, you have to commit not just that we're buying long-term debt today, but that you won't undo it in the future. If you buy long-term debt today and then resell it five years from now on the way, you've completely undone it. And if people expect that, then it un undoes it as well. So the answer, I, I can't prove, I don't have a slide with the equations because I wrote the equations yesterday. <laughs> uh, but um, to do it via quantitative easing, you have to buy the long-term debt and then commit that you won't resell the long-term debt along the way. Uh, and, and that's, um, so you have to do it in the context of an interest rate it makes interest rate forward guidance more credible at best, but it has to be in there with the interest rate forward guidance. Otherwise, you can undo it on, on the way to maturity. And it loses its effect in the fiscal theory. This is a theory with mm -hmm. complete market integration, and the entire fact is we're, we're and no fiscal responses to monetary policy. Uh, so it's not enough to just buy long-term debt. You also have to commit that you won't resell it again on the way to maturity. That's the that's the bottom line problem why you need a combination of QE and forward guidance. But right. stay tuned for the next paper. And, uh. <laughs> I just wanted to thank John very much for doing this. Uh, it's, uh, it's been great. Uh, it's been uh, really, really interesting. And uh, I'm, I'm, we're all glad we didn't have to travel or you didn't have to travel. Uh, and um, uh, we're going to take a break from the Trinity webinar for uh, the uh, job market period. And we'll hopefully be back in March. Uh, you will hear from us um, uh, sooner rather than later about the uh, speakers uh, coming up. Uh, if you want to present yourself, uh, let us know. Um, and um, other than that, uh, hope to see you soon at the meetings or, or at the Trinity webinar in March. And thanks again so much, John. It was really yeah, well, thanks, thanks, John. Thank all of you. I, I really appreciate it. This yeah. was a great, great opportunity. Thank you. Bye, everybody.